Thanks for joining us today as we conclude our study in the book of 1 John in a series that we called Testing Your Faith, Helping You Discern Where You Really Stand in Relationship with God. And the reason that we did this series was out of concern that people not fool themselves, spiritually speaking. You know, many people identify as a follower of Christ, but have they really put that to the test? You know, even Jesus himself said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. We lived by your name. But he's going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. And our concern is that people really start to think seriously about what type of relationship they have with God. And is it really one of a saving nature where he is God and Lord of their lives? Or is he just a system that they believe in? Is it, is it just a religiosity? And so John provided us with a series of tests that we've gone through. The first test was the obedience test. In other words, are you obeying Jesus? Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say? And so the obedience test is one that calls you back to uh, conviction of sin and confession of sin and turning away from sin. And then the next test was the love test. Are you actually loving others? Or are you just pretty much sticking to yourself, looking out for yourself? But John says that, no, if the love of God is in you, then the love of God is going to want to flow through you to others. And so one of the signs that you have the love of God in your life, that you've got God in your life, is that you actually have this deep love uh, for the well-being of other people. The third test then was the perseverance test. That authentic followers of Jesus Christ persevere to the end. Many people will sprout up in their faith and become excited, but, but it withers and dies, either because of pressures that come into their life or, or simply because they get distracted by lesser important things, uh, exposing that God isn't really the center point of their lives. But authentic followers of Jesus persevere with Jesus through whatever circumstances and stay true to him to the end. Uh, the next test was then the righteousness test. That, that we can know who a child of God is, is because they pursue righteousness. In other words, a follower of Jesus can't continue in defiant, uh, rebellious sin. If the Holy Spirit's in your life, he's going to be convicting you about sin, uh, confronting that sin in your life, calling you to turn away from that sin, which leads to death, and he wants to call you to life. And so an authentic follower of Jesus cannot defy continue in sin consciously and intentionally, the Holy Spirit's going to, to challenge you on that. And so then the next test was the spirit test. Who are you listening to? Are you really submitting to the Holy Spirit or are you listening to other voices? Could be evil spirits or false teachers. Are, are you really affirming that Jesus is God in the flesh? Because the Holy Spirit is affirming that and he, he'll affirm that in you. But if you're struggling with the identity of Jesus, if you keep pulling away from the identity of Jesus, then you may want to be uh, considering, is there some other voices, maybe even other spiritual voices speaking into your life to distract you away from Jesus? Then we had the family test. And the family test is simply, do you love the family of God? You know, Steve had mentioned that people will say, um, I love God, but I really don't like the church. And as Steve said, you can't say that because if God loves a church and he died for the church and he's building his church, then any follower of Jesus by nature has to have this incredible love for the church. It's just going to flow th from God through you to, to others. And you're going to care about the spiritual well-being of others. You're going to care about meeting together and celebrating the Father together. So, so this is the family test. And then we had the freedom test. If you really trust God's love, God's love is going to drive out all fear out of your life. Progressively, as you learn to trust his love more and more, you're going to discover fears ebb and fade away. And so the question is, what's controlling your life? Are fears and insecurities controlling your life? Or is God's love influencing and directing and controlling your life? Which do you listen to the most? Which controls you? Which determines your actions? And those that love God and trust his love discover they're increasingly becoming free of any fears and insecurities. And then finally, we talked about the overcoming test. That, that 
that in Christ Jesus, the world can't defeat you. It can't overcome you. You'll stand firm. You'll stand strong. And, and you will overcome sin. You will overcome the challenges. And you will persevere in the end. You are an overcomer. But if you're someone who plays the victim card, if you're someone that's always defeated, if you're someone that's always feeling life isn't right, well, then you need to question, is God really at work victoriously in your life, helping you overcome the challenges that you face? And so we've covered all these tests. And these tests by nature are not tests that you have to work hard at the pass. These are more tests in the sense that they reveal what's going on in your life. They expose what's going on in your life. And, uh, and John is saying that, that if you put these tests up to your life, you'll be able to be able to see, are you actually authentic, authentically submitting to Jesus Christ, following him, allowing his life and his love to flow in and through you? And if not, then that may just reveal that you haven't actually fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. You have not let his spirit into your life to transform you. Because what these tests are saying is these are just the natural outflows of the Christ follower's life, of, of the Holy Spirit being in your life. These things just are the, the, the consequences or the, the byproduct of someone who loved Jesus. And so if these things are missing from your life in, in any capacity, then you really want to start questioning, am I authentic, authentically submitting to Jesus Christ as Lord? trusting his spirit to, to work in me and through me in my love of God and love of others. <clears throat> and so if you have, in a sense, passed those tests, or if you've evaluated your life and you've come to the realization, no, I, I mean, I still am working in all these areas, but yes, I can affirm these areas in my life. Well, then John says there's really two rewards for you. There's two rewards at the end of the story. And, and that's what the fifth chapter is concluding with. And so the first reward is really a confidence in your relationship with God. A confidence, an assurance of that relationship. Listen to what John writes in 1 John 5, 13 to 15. He says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. That you may know you have it. And so if I was to ask you, Aren't you 100% certain that you're going to be with Christ throughout eternity? What's your response? Are you like 75, 60, 50, 50? Mm, not really sure. Well, John Wright says, well, that's not satisfactory. Do you really want to guess at your eternal future? Or do you want to know with certainty? And so John says, I have given you these sort of tests so you can evaluate where you're at and you can make life changes that you can surrender fully to the Lordship of Jesus Christ so that you can know with a certainty where you stand. And, and that, that every barrier through Christ has been removed between you and the Father. That he accepts you, he's adopted you, he's placed his spirit in you to, to ensure that you are his child. And so, you can know that you have eternal life with Jesus. See, every other religion in this world allows you uh, or does not allow you to have the certainty. Every other religion raises a question mark and, and you cannot know for sure, <clears throat> excuse me, because every other religion is a works-based, performance-based religion. You have to measure up, measure up, measure up. And the question is, have you measured up enough? And so in a works-based religion, you have to keep striving, you have to keep working, you have to keep proving yourself over and over and over again. <clears throat> and you're never there, you're, you're never fully finished. And at the very end, you could ditch it all and, and destroy it all because you have to measure up. And so if you ask people as they start sharing their faith with you, are you 100% for sure knowing that you are going to be with Christ in eternity, at his right hand, seated beside him on the throne? If they can't say, oh, no, 100% for sure, then, then they're saying their whole faith-based system is uncertain. They don't know if, if they've accomplished, if they've passed the tests in that sense. But John is writing saying, you can know. And you should know. You should be 100% confident of your relationship. If you were to ask me, Rob, are you married? 
I should be guessing at that. I think I'm married. I'm pretty sure. I really hope I'm married. No, there should be a confident knowledge and certainty in the relationship. Yes, I'm married. And spiritually speaking, yes, I'm married to God. I'm in covenant relationship with Him. And so this is only possible not because we've measured up, not because we've done anything right, not because we've worked hard and performed these tests, because Jesus has performed for us. He's measured up for us. And if we simply accept him into our life, then he measures up on our behalf. And we know we have a certainty of relationship with God in, in eternity. And again, it's not a test in the sense of measuring up. It's simply the tests just reveal, have I actually come to Jesus? Have I invited Jesus to come into my life, to transform my life, to be Lord and leader of my life? And is my life centered around him? There's nothing I have to do. He'll do all the work. And in fact, he'll do the work through me. But the tests are really just exposing, have I allowed him to come into my life to do that work? And, and if, I, if I'm not passing some of these tests, that may be an indicator I haven't really surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And so, the first test, then, or the first reward John's saying is, in Jesus, if, you, if you've evaluated your life in all these areas, then you can know with certainty that you're in the Son, the Son is in you, you're in the Father, the Father is in you, and you'll have eternal relationship with Him. And then John starts to describe a second reward for being in Christ, and that's why I call uh, the confidence in prayer. So we have a confidence in our relationship with God, but now we also have a confidence in our in our communication with God, in our prayer life with Him. Listen to what he says in verse 14. And we are confident that He hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases Him. And since we know He hears us when we make our requests, we also know that He, he will give us what we ask for. And so this confidence in relationship translates to a confidence in our prayer life that you can actually approach your prayer life with a certain degree of, of confidence that he's going to hear you and he's going to respond to what you ask. And obviously, there's more to this discussion than this brief statement that John makes. It's obviously, if you bring a sinful request to him, he's not going to answer it. If you bring something that's opposed to his purposes and his agenda, he's not going to answer that. But if you bring a request to him, as he says here, if we ask for anything that pleases him, if it's holy, if it's, uh, uh, if it's embracing his mission and his love for people, if it's, it's going to accomplish his purposes, well, that pleases him. He says, yes, now you're on side. Now I, I, I'll take what you've asked for and let's do it together because it's pleasing him. It fits perfectly with what he wants to accomplish in you and through you and in the lives of other people. And so, so the, this is exciting because then as, as I grow in relationship with Jesus, then, then I start to become more in sync with what pleases God. And, and this then says that this prayer assumes this relationship and, and where his purposes are then being expressed through you. As you grow in a love for God, you grow in a love for what he loves. And what God wants to accomplish, is his purposes and his mission become your purpose and your mission. And, and, and you, you partner with God in such intimate, effective ways. And so this type of prayer, though, reflects really a deep, intimate walk with God. You know, the type that Jesus modeled for us. You know, whatever Jesus asked for, it was answered. Because Jesus was in sync with the Father. And what Jesus asked for pleased the Father. And the Father said, yes, let's do that. And, and, and so the Father and the Son are working together as one. And that's what God wants to do with you. He wants to work with you in relationship uh, such that you are saying, God, what you want to accomplish, I want to accomplish too. And say, hey, God, I believe you want to accomplish this. W would you go and you do this? And you see, the struggle that, that I have in my prayer life is I don't have the type of walk with the Father that Jesus had. I still get focused on my agenda, what I want to do, my comforts, my security. Um, you know, I'm not always willing to put myself out there. And, and so Jesus might be walking over here, and I say, Jesus, I'm just going to stay back here. 
And I miss out on the relationship joy and the journey and the mission and the effectiveness. And, and my prayers become a little bit more self-focused or what I think God should do as opposed to getting in sync with the heart and the mind of Jesus and what he wants to do. You see, whenever we say uh, in our prayers at the tag end, we say, in Jesus' name, is that just a tag expression that gives some clout to our prayer saying, hey, God's going to listen now because I said in Jesus' name. Does God really work that way? Why do we say in Jesus' name? Well, what we're really saying is, Father, in my relationship with Jesus, I've come to discover this is the type of thing Jesus wants done. And if Jesus wants it done, it's because you want it done. And so, Father, I'm bringing these, this prayer request before you on behalf of Jesus because I believe he wants to work in this world in this way. And so I'm bringing this in Jesus' name because it fits with his mission, his purpose, his character. And, and in, in so saying, it also fits with your mission and your purpose and your character. And so, so really, when I say in Jesus' name, what I'm confessing is, Father, I'm, I'm wanting to reflect Jesus' purposes in the world. I want to pray for what Jesus wants. I'm not just here representing me and my selfish desires. I'm representing your intentions and your purposes. And so would you, in your purposes, work in this way because that will honor you and glorify your name and build your kingdom here. And so, so we come to him and we say, Father, in Jesus' name, because this pleases you. Would you do this? And the Father says, yeah, that's exciting. Let's do it together. John then goes on in verses 16 and 17, he's, and he's going to take this prayer dynamic a little bit farther. And to be honest, this is a, a, a very challenging passage to understand. But let's work through it together. He says, If you see a Christian brother or sister sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray. And God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying you should pray for those who commit it. All wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. Wow, what is this saying? What is this prayer that you pray for people that are sinning but doesn't lead to death, but you don't pray for people who are sinning a sin that does lead to death? How do you discern the difference? What is going on here? Well, he starts off saying, when you see someone sinning, you should love that person. You should be deeply concerned for that person. Not judgmentally, not condemning them. Oh, you're sinning, you need to. No, that's, that's from a position of not love. That's from a position of says, you're doing wrong, you're not measuring up. That's not John's framework here. John's framework is this. If you see a brother or a sister in Christ, who's sinning. In other words, they're, they're wounding their relationship with God and it's robbing them of life. It's robbing them of joy. It's robbing them of intimacy with, with God. You want to speak into their life. So what then is the prayer that you're praying for them that will lead them to life? Well, ultimately, I think that's got to be a, a prayer that says it's a prayer of conviction of sin. God, would you convict that person of sin? And as you convict them and they repent, would you then bring spiritual healing into, into their life? And you, would you restore them? Whenever we see someone sinning, we're supposed to be spiritually concerned for that person. Again, not from a judging, condemning standpoint, but from a spiritual love standpoint that says, I want what's best for them in Christ Jesus. And they're missing out. And it's going to hurt them. It's going to hurt those they're in relationship with. Him, and, and I just care about them too much. And so even uh, Paul says in Galatians uh, that if we see a brother sinning, we're, we're to talk to them about that sin. We, that is our spiritual responsibility rooted in love for the person. But Paul even says, guard yourselves so that you don't, that you don't then sin. And so James affirms this idea of praying for people when there's sin in their life. It says in James 5, 14, 15, are any of you sick? Uh, you should call the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well, and if you've committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. There's some sort of connection here in, in this type of, of prayer that they're, they're between sin and illness. And this isn't always the case, but sometimes that the illness we have is rooted in the sin that we have. 
And that as we come to the elders of the church and we confess sin, that that, that opens up the door then for God to come in and bring uh, forgiveness and healing into our lives. Spiritual healing, but also physical healing. And we've actually seen this happen. There have been times when people have struggled with illness where we've discovered there actually is a spiritual root. And as soon as they dealt with the spiritual root, they confessed it and, and they reconciled to God and they, they did whatever they need to do around that, that then not just spiritual healing, but actually physical healing came into their lives instantaneously. And, and it was amazing to see. I mean, John said earlier in, in his uh, writing in John um, 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9, but if we confess our sins, sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Now, we know that all sin leads to death, ultimately, but Jesus has paid that death penalty for us. And so, so now when a believer sins, that doesn't lead to death. That leads to a loss of joy, a loss of peace, a loss of intimacy in the relationship with God. But it doesn't lead to death. It just needs to be something that needs to be confessed and repented of so that they can get back onto the life track with Jesus as opposed to, to the things that bring death to their joy, peace, and life and fulfillment. And so, but John here says, but there is a sin that does lead to death and you don't need to pray about that because it leads to death and that's where there's going. There, there's no forgiveness in other words. Uh, Jesus mentioned this in Matthew uh, chapter 12 verse 31 to 32. Jesus said, every sin and blasphemy, blasphemy can be forgiven. Okay? Every sin, every blasphemy can be forgiven. Uh, and so in other words, you can't out -sin God in that sense. You cannot say, oh, look at what I've done over here, how I treated people. Like, whatever you've done, it can be uh, forgiven. And you need to understand that. You can't out -sin God's grace. Jesus' death and resurrection is more powerful than your sin. But then he goes on, he says, except, except um, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Wow. So what is that? He goes on and says, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. In other words, it's easy to misunderstand who Jesus is. It's easy to say, I'm not really sure. Is Jesus really God? Is he really in the flesh? Like, it's understandable that people struggle with these issues. In fact, they should struggle with them. They should work through those things. So, so, so the fact that people don't fully get who Jesus is at the beginning, we get that. But he goes on and he says, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. And so, how does one blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? What exactly does that mean? Well, Jesus was talking to the religious elite of the day who saw Jesus in action. They saw all the miracles he did. They saw him heal the blind. They saw him heal the lame. He saw him cast out evil spirits. He did all these things before their very eyes. And it was obviously the powerful working of the Holy Spirit setting people free from bondage and giving them life. And as people turn to Jesus, suddenly they're becoming free and joyful and, and the, the life of God just transforming them. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were so defiant in their rebellion against Jesus, in, in their fight against Jesus, that even when Jesus did these obviously, obviously empowered by the Holy Spirit activities, they attribute it to evil. In fact, not only did they say what he was doing was evil, they said that it was empowered by the evil one himself. This is the work, the undeniable uh, work of the Holy Spirit exposed before their eyes, but their hearts were so hardened they could not acknowledge that this was the working of God. Their hearts were so evilly bent that they took what was righteous and they declared it evil. And so what they were essentially doing was saying, we refuse to honor the Holy Spirit working in and through Jesus in this way. We see what he's doing, we see the goodness, we see the righteousness, we see it all, but we declare it evil. I believe Jesus is saying, when your heart is that hardened, there's no room for conviction, and as a result, there's no room for repentance. 
So there's no room for forgiveness. Your heart just never gets there. Their hearts are so uh, against the identity of Jesus, who God is, the working of the Holy Spirit. And they just embrace what the evil one wants them to embrace. They have the, the evil one's view of God. And so when someone's that hardened, then God says, yeah, there's no room for them. You don't even need to pray for that. Um, you don't pray for that type of healing. Now, how do we know some, where someone's at? That's, you got to be careful with that. He doesn't say you can't pray, actually. He says you don't need to worry about praying for that. You don't need to pray for people. But we still pray for people. We say, God, would you still convict no matter how far they've gone? But you know what? In some cases, they are just so defiant, their hearts will not respond. Now, we take a look at though someone like the apostle, like Saul of Tarsus. We would seem to think he was in that category, and yet God did a transforming work in his life. But that's because he, he, he was just, he was fighting against the identity of Jesus. Jesus, And that can be forgiven. But when you see the Holy Spirit work through Jesus or through his people, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit that you're against, well, boy, you need to be really careful. But here, here's the thing that we encounter. People wonder, well, have I already committed that sin? A am I there? Am I perhaps guilty of that? If you're concerned about that, then you're not guilty of it. Because there's already convicting work going on. You're concerned about it. You're concerned about what God might think about you. You're concerned about your eternal future with God. But see, people in this state don't care. Their hearts are so hardened, they just don't care. And so, if there is a sin in your life, then, well, don't become hardened. Confess it. Repent of it. In other words, turn away from that sin and walk with Jesus walk with Jesus. See, that's what it's all about. Do you want to walk with Jesus? Or do you just want to walk your own walk, hoping Jesus will bless what you're doing? Doesn't work that way. Jesus is inviting you to walk with him. You and him in covenant relationship together, representing the Father. And the Holy Spirit's going to work in and through you to lead and direct and empower your life to do just that. And so John finishes off his letter and he says this in verse 18. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning. In other words, children of God do not continue to sin. They don't excuse their sin. They don't justify their sin. They don't continue in their sin. They call it what it is. That's sin in my life, and it needs to stop today. And Jesus, would you now give me the freedom and the power to, to surrender that to you? It might be uncomfortable, it might be difficult, it might be challenging, but I'm stopping it. I'm just stopping it. I'm not going to wean off it. I'm just, I'm just going to cut that sin out now. And, and I'll, I'll experience what I have to, have to experience as a consequence in that, but I, because I want to be free and I just want to have no barriers between me and you. He goes on and says, For God's Son holds them securely. See, you can say no to sin because you know Jesus has got you. Yeah, it might be uncomfortable for a while if, if there's some patterns in your life that are hard to let go of, but, but Jesus has got you. Even as you go through that difficult that letting it go process, he's got you in, in your hands. And the evil one then cannot touch them. In other words, Satan can't, can't harm you. Satan can't, can't derail, you, derail you. If you're trusting in Jesus, if you're in his hands, you're okay. You're safe. He goes on and says, we know that we are children of God. We know it. I'm a child of God. And the world around us is under the control of the evil one. So, in other words, yeah, I'm his child. Now, I know the rest of the world's not going to be crazy about that. I know the rest of the world's going to be opposed to that. But you know what? I know who I am. And then he says in verse 20, And we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. You see, I get to know God now. I get to have a relationship with God. I get to talk to God, and he hears me, and he responds. And he's going to do life with me, and he's going to empower me, and he's going to lead me on his purposes. And now we live in fellowship with the true God, because we live in fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God, and he is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. 
I like a more, a more accurate translation is, little children, keep yourselves from idols. In other words, there is a lot of idols in our life and our journey with God, our fellowship with Jesus is, is going to be a process of stripping away those idols. These things that we set up as, as priorities in our life that really can do nothing for our lives. Uh, really, what an idol is, is anything that we think we need in order to be happy, to be fulfilled, to have life, to have joy, contentment, peace. An idol is anything that we think has to be there in order for me to be okay. And Jesus is saying, would you strip those away? Would you stop relying on those things, those false crutches? And would you lie on me, the one support of your life, the one who gives you life, the author of life himself? And so he says, understanding your relationship with Jesus and fellowship with him, then start identifying anything in your life that distracts you from a deeper walk with Jesus and his family, the church. What's been keeping you from church? What's been keeping you from worshiping with the family of God, our Father in Jesus Christ, who has rescued you? See, Jesus is the hero of your story. Gather together with others to celebrate him. And if anything is hindering that time of worship together or is hindering your walk with him throughout the day, anything that you're chasing after instead of him, then the Holy Spirit wants to convict you about that. Expose that in your life. And, and he's calling you to identify it to confess it, repent of it, in other words, turn away from it, and walk with Jesus instead. And so, as you go through this next week, I really encourage you to consider, are there barriers in your life? Are there things hindering you that you need to make a decision about right now? You need to say, that needs to stop. Because not only is that affecting your life, it's affecting whoever you're modeling spiritual life to. If you have children, your children are going to model your spiritual walk. They're going to learn to embrace the idols that you've taught them to embrace. They're going to learn to be distracted by the things that you've allowed to distract you and them. And so, not just for yourself, but also for, for those you represent God to. Turn away from sin. Turn back to God. Know with certainty the relationship that you have. And really just enjoy God. Remember, it's not about measuring up. It's not about performing. It's about stripping away the things in your life that hinder that intimacy so you can have greater joy, greater peace, greater fulfillment, and greater effectiveness in this world. So you can love others just the way that Jesus does through you. So let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that you have loved us. I thank you that Jesus came out of that intense love and was willing to suffer and die for us so that we could know you. And Father, now as we turn to Jesus and we embrace Jesus' Spirit in our life, his Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, would you come in and set us free from all bondages to sin? Would you expose any areas where we have false idols, anything that we turn to, anything we think we need for life apart from Jesus? Would you expose those and give us the courage and the strength to say no to sin and yes to Jesus? And so, Father, even now, as you do that transforming work in our life, would you also give us a deeper love for the church and for its mission and purpose in the world? And would we just see people grow into a deeper walk with you because how we show love to them on your behalf. Do that incredible work, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us for this whole series. We hope that you found it provocative, challenging, but also encouraging and transforming in your walk with Jesus. Have a great week.